Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Danya Sethuraman and today I'm going to be presenting my research on the role of stress-induced inflammation in schizophrenia. So a little bit about me, I'm currently a senior at Mission San Jose High School in Fremont, California. Uh, some of the things that I enjoy doing are dance, specifically Bhagavanatyam and Bollywood, as well as playing field hockey and listening to music. I intend to major in neuroscience and or molecular, cellular, and developmental biology, and I want to combine those two interests into a medical and research-oriented career in developmental neuroimmunology. Um, to the left here, we can see a little picture of myself and my dog, Odin. He's eight years old and is a Maltese mix, and we're really good friends. I'd also like to thank my mentor, Courtney rivet Noor at this time. She is a PhD candidate at the University of Virginia, and she's been a great friend as well as a great mentor in trying to help me find what I'm interested in and what I enjoy. So thank you so much for being such a pivotal person in my life, Courtney. Um, so for the agenda for today, uh, I'm going to be going over the overview, so what schizophrenia is, as well as what the objective of my research hey, is. Hi, yes. Uh, sorry, we can all see just like the screen showing your slides and like mm -hmm. the scrolling through the slides on the left, but we can't see your actual presenter view. Oh, okay. Um, Do you have two desktops or something? Are you showing on another monitor maybe? Uh, no, I'm oh, not. Okay. Um, okay, let me try stopping screen share and then, Tripping. sorry about that. It's okay. Um, how about now? Much better. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, should I just start from the beginning or um, should I just continue? Um, okay, I'll just go ahead and continue. <laughs> All right, so um, back to the agenda. I'm going to be going over what schizophrenia is as well as what my objective of my research was. Um, and then going into the three main mechanisms that I focused on in my paper, which were stress, inflammation, and the gut brain axis. At the end, I'll wrap everything together with the conclusions, significance, and where I want to go from, from here. So diving right in, schizophrenia is a severe heterogeneous mental illness. And basically, it is a heterogeneous mental illness, meaning that there are two different types of symptoms, positive and negative. Positive, you can think of as things that are added on from a baseline, things that aren't supposed to be there, like delusions, hallucinations, and disorganized speech. Negative are things that are subtracted from a baseline, um, so the decreased ability to show emotion, the decreased ability to think and speak coherently, for example. There are lots of treatments with schizophrenia, including resistance and paranoia to antipsychotic medication, as well as strains of schizophrenia, like treatment-resistant schizophrenia. And these challenges basically lead to higher rates of suicides and lots of poor prognoses for this illness, making research in this area really important. In terms of what we do know in schizophrenia, there are a few factors that predispose people to it, such as genetics, autoimmune and gastrointestinal disease, obstetric pathogenic exposure, as well as inflammation. And inflammation is the main mechanism that I focus on in my paper. So going over the objective of my research, what I wanted to do is to use a new perspective called neuroimmunology, um, since there's been so much confusion on the etiology of schizophrenia for decades of research, and try to improve the prognosis, and most importantly, delay and prevent onset eventually. I started doing this by doing this literature review, um, covering 36 research papers. As, and if I wanted to summarize my research in one sentence, I'd say that I want to propose a mechanism of stress-triggered inflammation that leads to psychosis and schizophrenic onset. So knowing this, let's jump right into the first part of my research, which was stress. In my paper, I define stress as both physical and emotional, as well as chronic and acute. So stress was an agent of inflammation and schizophrenic symptoms. And some forms of stress that I focused on were trauma, including physical, social, emotional, and sexual abuse, separation from parents, pathogenic exposure in pregnancy, including uh, influenza, toxoplasmic gondi, and herpes simplex virus one and two, economic situation and physical and mental illness. There are two ways that stress can impact schizophrenia, through directly or indirect impacts. 
For direct impacts, we find that acute stress, uh, physical and sexual trauma specifically, have been correlated with a sevenfold increase in psychotic symptoms. Um, and indirect impacts, such as inflammation, have been found to go through the gut, brain, and periphery. And that's what I focus on in my paper. So in terms of inflammation, I focused on cytokinetic inflammation, specifically three main cytokines, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-6, as well as interleukin-1 beta. Um, these cytokines have been found to impact lots of pathways in schizophrenia, and some of them are on this slide above. One of them is that they basically regulate the kynurenine pathway and pr stimulate production of kynurenic acid and quinolinic acid, two harmful metabolites. Kynurenic acid actually causes NMDA receptor hypofunction, which has been known to cause both positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia. These cytokines have also been known to disassemble blood-brain barrier tight junction proteins, and that causes local inflammation as well as inflammatory feedback loops. They um, also invade the fetal CNS even before the subject is born and predisposes them to inflammation later on in life, which as you can see is probably really harmful for genetically vulnerable subjects especially. Um, these cytokines can also induce death of neural stem cells, causing neurodegeneration in schizophrenia, as well as stimulate hypothalamic cortisol production, which has been linked to positive and negative symptoms in schizophrenia. Um, in my paper, I also focus on the gut-brain axis as a main mechanism of infl inflammation. Um, I focus on two different branches, so gut dysbiosis and glutamine concentration changes. Gut dysbiosis describes the change in gut bacteria populations and leads to short-chain fatty acid decreases. And the decrease in SCFAs basically leads to more inflammation and more inflammatory feedback loops. I also focus on glutamine concentration changes. And glutamine is basically a conditionally essential amino acid in the gut that is used for a lot of intestinal lining and mucosal integrity in tight junction protein function and prevents inflammation in the blood-brain barrier and through the pathway called the NFK beta pathway. So um, there's definitely a big correlation between stress causing these gut brain axis inflammatory mechanisms and propagating inflammation through the mechanisms we discussed before as well. So overall, we definitely see that there's a clear correlation between chronic stress and inflammation driven changes to schizophrenic symptoms. We discussed kynurenine pathway changes leading to NMDA receptor hypofunction um, gut changes and blood-brain barrier changes linking together to cause a pro-inflammatory feedback loop, as well as stress basically causing all of these symptoms and propagating inflammation overall. However, as exciting as all of this research is to try to improve prognosis, there's definitely further research that's needed to equate um, correlation with causation. From here, however, what I want to do is manipulate variables at specific points in a genetically vulnerable patient's life, such as the ones I have listed on the slide genetic counseling before um, conception, obstetric monitoring to prevent any type of pathogenic exposure, controlling stress at home and social environments, as well as physical stress throughout their lives, and using gut supplementation and immunotherapy to try to prevent and delay onset overall. I think that's the main goal overall. And um, we can definitely see how schizophrenia is a classic example of what happens when the body uh, interacts with different systems externally and internally to sort of cause this harmful self-propagating loop into an illness. And what excites me about this field, neuroimmunology, is that it's a cross-systematic approach that makes me hopeful for improvement of prognosis in this illness, as well as similarly devastating uh, autoimmune and mental illnesses in the future. So thank you so much for listening to my presentation. If you guys have any questions, you can ask them right now or contact me through my email or LinkedIn. Thank you so much. Alrighty, thanks so much, Danya. Um, if you have any questions, people can uh, either ask in the chat or on the Q and A. Uh, make sure you're on the session tab and not the event tab. In the meantime, I do have a question. Um, you mentioned the role of stress. Are there a lot of other neurodegenerative diseases or other diseases where stress is, you know, an evidence-based factor, risk factor for the disease that you know? Um yeah, I believe there is evidence for both Parkinson's as well as Alzheimer's, um, because both of them, uh, interestingly, have also been found to have a neuroimmune basis. So you can sort of connect both of them, seeing that 
stress linking to inflammation, and schizophrenia is also applicable to other types of neurodegenerative diseases. Also, while people are typing their questions, could the other presenters also request uh, to share your audio and video? And then it'll add you to the queue for me, and I can add you as we go. Oh, there are two more questions for you in the chat. I can read them out loud for you if you want. The first one is, great talk. Are there any specific interventions that you would ideally like to use? Um, right, so I think I guess uh, Courtney's and Brianna's question sort of link together. So I guess in terms of interventions, like I mentioned, I think gut supplementation and immunotherapy are two things that I really want to research into more. Um, in terms of gut supplementation, um, because I did mention glutamine, glutamine is a really big part in uh, the gut-brain axis. I think glutamine supplementation, um, L-glutamine pills are have been found to help in illnesses like leaky gut syndrome, which are actually linked to schizophrenia and other illnesses. So I think researching on L-glutamine in particular is really helpful. Um, and then in terms of immunotherapy, I think um, while I'm not familiar with the specific types of immunotherapy, I know that there are illnesses like NMDA receptor encephalitis, which is an autoimmune um, illness that causes NMDA receptor hypofunction, which is linked to schizophrenia, like I mentioned. Um, and because they use immunotherapy for that illness, um, it actually involves psychosis. So the fact that the immunotherapy works to prevent psychosis in that illness might be applicable to schizophrenia as well, since it is sort of overlapping. So I would definitely try to research more into immunotherapies used in NMDA receptor encephalitis in schizophrenia as well. Okay, thank you so much, Tanya. Um, I think any other questions we may have to hold for the end or they can contact you otherwise, I think in the interest of time, we'll move on to the next presenter. Right. Uh, great job. So the next presenter is going to be Kristen. I will add you into the video. All right, hi. hi. I will share my screen. Okay, cool. All righty, sounds good. Yeah, so I'll I'll leave for now, and then you'll see me. You'll see my name pop up as a two minute mark, your two minute warning, and then I'll turn on my video when it's time to wrap. Got it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right. Hi, I'm Kristen Yu. Um, I'm a junior, and today I will be presenting and understanding the imperceptibility disorder of onosognosia. Um, essentially, my presentation will co cover defining onosognosia, assessments and diagnosis, treatments, and community and social approaches to onosognosia. The simple and bare bones definition of onosognosia provided by the American Psychological Association is essentially that it's a neurologically based failure to recognize the existence of a deficit or a disorder. But technically, a satisfactory definition of onosognosia is unattainable and basically impossible. This is because when we use onosognosia in the field, it isn't referring to a certain symptom, but rather denoting aspects of a patient's behavior in relation to their Ill illness, which is unlikely to depend on specific set of causes exclusively related to them, which means as we look at onosognosia, we have to determine them by case-by-case -case procedures, and we have to tailor each um, case to the patient. Um, before I move on, I want to make it explicitly clear that onosognosia is not denial. Denial is an impaired self-awareness, but it is a partial syndrome of unawareness, and it is a defensive me method of coping that we see in mental illnesses, but onosognosia is a complete syndrome of unawareness. Right. So far, on assessments and diagnosis of onosognosia are not really um, well researched. There isn't a single measure that can fully explore the multifaceted nature of onosognosia. But when we do look at assessments and diagnosis, we want to focus on six main traits, which is awareness of deficit and related functional implications, modality, specificity, casual attribution, expectations of recovery, implicit knowledge, and differential diagnosis with psychological denial. The five main ways that researchers and physicians are assessing osnosia is the sum D, which is scale to assess unawareness of mental disorder, and essentially places insight on a spectrum. And this is tested by awareness, understanding, and attribution. But time after time, we see that they don't cover the multifaceted nature of osnosia, as I mentioned before, because osnosia ranges from different patients to patients. 
Um, the second one is functional neuroimaging techniques. These are just um, single photon mission computed tomography, which is the SPECT position positron emission tomography, which is the PET scan, and functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is the fMRI. And these are used to assess the neurocorrelates of onsenosia and mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease and any physical trauma done to the brain. This is really, really useful. Um, but again, this is only um, available to those who have access to these resources. The third one is the clinician rating of pa patient's awareness of illness strategy. In this strategy, there is a routine clinical or semi-structured interview where examiner is able to classify the patients afterwards with onsenosia, whether that's full, partial, or no awareness of deficits. It is relatively unreliable because you can't assess someone with fluctuating onsenosia in one sitting or multiple sittings that span from 30 minutes to an hour. Next one is the prediction of performance discrepancy, which is used a lot in research um, when we look at onsenosia. And essentially, it's a patient's report about their level of performance on a given neuropsychological task. And the level of onsenosia is the difference between the patient's estimation of performance and actual store, score. Um, there are a lot of conceptual and method, methodological limitations, but so far this has been one of the main ways people are driving evidence and seeing how we can improve um, people with onsenosia. And the last one is patient caregiver discrepancy strategy. This is really, really helpful as it's basically a, a comparison to the patient's level of performance as they tell the physician and the caregiver's um, assessment of the patients and their level of performance and behavior and mood changes. But again, this needs a lot of research and a constant caregiver day in, day out. Again, with treatments, there are not a lot of treatments but what we do know with onsenosia is that we must have an open dialogue in a supportive environment for the person with onsenosia. This is because if we burn bridges, a lot of times we won't be able to connect with these patients. And a lot of times they feel isolated and depressed and they mistrust people because they believe that they're diagnosing them with something that they have no ability to perceive. Um, two main methods are the LEAP evaluation method, which is basically listening, empathizing, agreeing, and partnering the a person. And the second one is the MET, which is motivational enhancement therapy, where um, we we um, or the therapist motivates someone to alter their self-image and encourages patients to get treatment. It helps people look at their symptoms, behaviors, and relationships, and they hopefully lead to a realization. But as you can probably tell immediately, these two both rely heavily on the patients coming to their own realization. Um, the last one is antipsychotic medication. Um, Anosinosia is found really popularly in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And a lot of times we see that if these patients are taking their antipsychotic medication for their disorder, it does help alleviate anosinosia. But again, they don't believe that they have these disorders. So it's really, really hard to um, ha have them take the medication. And because of this, anosinosia is actually the leading um, reason why people don't take medication in these disorders. So what do we do? Well, there are a lot of community and social approaches we can do to tackle this problem. In the science community, we must recruit a large and diverse sample, psychological and control samples, and gather stable and prevalent rates of anosognosia. And we must leverage um, and apply current evidence-based treatments towards anosognosia, whether it's from um, other disorders that we see high risk of anosognosia from or similar brain disorders. Um, we must learn how to make tr treatment less clinical so there is a sense of trust and empathy between the patients, the caregivers, and the physicians. And we must raise, raise awareness. This is extremely underdeveloped and under-researched. It affects so many people and it affects people in super popularized disorders like Alzheimer's disease, hemiplegia, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. Um, if we we learn how to raise awareness, it might also drive out the financial burden of constantly being in the care cycle. 
And lastly, it's so important that we develop this. Uh, not only will help tremendously in the rehabilitation process, but we can also learn more about mechanisms of recovery and deterioration in various brain disorders. It also will give us insights into brain organization and the human consciousness and give us huge improvements or in study in the body mind problem and subject in the psychological field. Um, Thank you. I, I just want to say thank you to everyone listening. This is such a big step because of how Osnuja is so under um, known and not a lot of people know. Just you listening and being the STEM leaders of the future and knowing about this disorder already is a huge step to more research. And I'll like to open the floor to questions now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kristen. Great job. Yeah, as you said, I think let's open the floor for questions. Uh, if you can type them in the session to add either in the chat or the Q&A. I did have a question while people are typing, though. Um, how did you first get interested in this topic? Um, well, actually, I took a psychology course in college, and um, I started just being diving into psychology and really understanding it. And I have this, I was really interested in mental disorders like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, but they're so, they're researched a ton. They're really popularized and a lot of people know about it. And I started diving into this world on synosia, which is so prevalent in these disorders that is so under-researched. And I felt it's so weird that this disorder is goes hand in hand with all of these popular disorders, but no one seems to know about it. And because of that, I thought, what better to do than to be a teen who can connect with other teens and future people who are going to excel in the STEM division and learn about anastinosia so we can actually provide help for these people. And it can go back full circle. And not only can we provide help for these people, but advanced studies in the psychological development department in consciousness and human and body and mind. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, there's a comment <laughs> rather than a question. Uh, Danya says, thank you so much for talking about the social significance of your research. Kristen, I enjoyed your presentation so much. Thank you so much. Any other questions for Kristen? We'll wait a little bit longer, just in case. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Yeah, sometimes people take a long time to type. Uh, Bree asks, uh, so great to learn about this. Aside from awareness and compassion, what do you think could best help these patients? I think when we look, um, obviously, awareness and compassion and empathy, but it's very, very difficult because um, I don't think we can necessarily put um, awareness and compassion aside, because all, everything that we do builds off of empathy. Um, and with empathy and with building trust, then they will they will learn how to um, they'll not only trust people, but also trust taking their medication and just going to therapy and, and stuff like that. So if we build off of empathy, we can um, have people go into like met therapy and and stuff that will kind of bring their awareness to another level um going to therapy and also taking medication is really important um but then we go into like the side of like financial burdens and if we get scans and we get all of that that's it's a whole nother side of things but i think um just as a baseline it's really important just to be empathetic so and to build that trust so they can go to these therapies and to get this treatment to go to research um clinics and all of that thank you for that question um what thing um, where do you want to go here from research rights? Um, like I said earlier, I want to urge for um, more more control groups and more diverse group because it's so under um, research. I definitely want to see a really great baseline of like where we see anastinosia in high risk patients. Where can we? And then once we know that, we can kind of um, like pull from these different disorders what works best for them and see if it applies there. And we can get closer to the problem because so many research and development done in anastinosia is not for anastinosia. A lot of them are specialists in schizophrenia and bipolar. And all of a sudden they learn that this is a huge thing in these patients. And they're like, oh, we should probably research a little bit on anastinosia. So having people research specifically for anastinosia would be Am amazing and just tremendous step in Ozzy 
Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Kristen. That was a really good presentation on a topic that I personally had not heard of before. As well. <laughs> You've done your job of raising awareness. Good job. Thank you. Our next presenter is going to be Pranav. I will add you. Hello. Uh, go ahead and click the share screen button. And then same goes for you. I will leave and then I'll come back with just my video off at the two minute warning and then I'll uh, turn my video back on when it's time to wrap up. Okay, so wait, can can you see my screen? Okay, uh, so my project, uh, I basically built a Raspberry Pi based surveillance system. So first of all, about myself, my name is Pranav. I live in Los Altos, California. Some things I do outside of school are that I play tennis and I also have uh, a PC hardware blog that I founded and I also play the Mridangam, which is an ancient percussion instrument. So. Uh, the goal of my project was to create a surveillance system that brings the same functionality as retail options from companies like Ring or Nest, but do so at a much cheaper cost so that it's more accessible. Uh, so the features that my project included, uh, well, first of all, it uh, automatically records upon detecting motion. Um, and so basically, um, along with that, you can also take manual photographs. There's also a web interface where you can access the live camera feed from every single uh, three cameras that I included in my um, uh, system from one location. You can also uh, take advantage of the LED lights that are next to each camera, which improve the low light performance uh, drastically. So you can use the system even at nighttime. So the way this actually works, as you can see from the diagram, I have three different Raspberry Pis. Each one is wired to a camera uh, and basically uh, each one of those camera plus Pi units is connected using Wi-Fi to a NAS. So what is a NAS? It's basically just a PC that's optimized to have a ton of storage and doesn't necessarily have to have very much computing power. And um, essentially, each one of these Raspberry Pis is running something called Motion iOS, which is a Linux distribution that turns something, turns a, a, com a single board computer into something where you can see a live camera feed from a web interface. And the way that I'm able to link all of these together to see all three camera feeds in one location is by using an application called Docker, which is essentially just a virtual machine. That way I can run motion iOS, which is generally not meant for a standard X64 computer. And I can, I'm able to still run that on the NAS and connect all of these Raspberry Pis to that NAS wirelessly and then view the camera feed for all of them. Um, and this is an image of one of the, um, uh, camera plus Raspberry Pi units. Uh, and just so you know how it looks, you can also see the LED lights that are uh, on either side of the camera lens. Uh, and uh, these two images illustrate the uh, capabilities of these infrared lights that I added. Uh, so as you can see, they, they both have, uh, they, they have the uh, capability to add a lot of uh, night vision functionality to the system. So first of all, on the on the left image, you can see that the room is pitch black. It's the same room on the right, and it's also pitch black. But on the right image, you can see basically every major object in the room, and you have a lot more uh, of an idea of uh, what is actually happening in the room. So that's the value of adding the lights. But there is a noteworthy downside, which is that the color accuracy becomes significantly worse. So as you can see in these two images, it's the same scene. Uh, and on the left image, my shirt looks gray, but it actually is red, as you can see on the image on the right. Uh, it's not a perfect comparison since the rightmost image is taken on my phone at a much higher resolution, but you still get a good appreciation for how much better the color accuracy is on a standard camera and how this in infrared technology does uh, have a trade-off, but in my opinion, it's a worthy trade-off since for a surveillance system, you're more concerned with how um, much you can see at all times rather than the actual image quality. So this is a comparison of the uh, features and price of my system versus retail options. The only functionality that mine doesn't offer that theirs do is the uh, Alexa and Google Home support, which uh, in my opinion is not really that uh, uh, useful because um, the, the reason why is because 99% of the, oh, sorry, 99% um, of the time you wouldn't even be using that functionality. And what matters most is the core functionality of 
the surveillance system, for example, uh, having like hard drive space to actually store your footage. But the thing is, both of these retail options, not only is their base price for the equipment itself significantly higher than mine, uh, you also have to pay a very pricey subscription fee to even be able to record any footage at all. Uh, but with mine, since you're able to leverage existing hardware in your household, you don't have to worry about that additional cost whatsoever. Um, and some next steps that I would consider including to my uh, project so that I could um, improve it further would first of all be to make it battery powered. So I'll just go back a few slides. So as you can see here, my uh, Raspberry Pi is wired to a power outlet. You can't see the power outlet, but you can see the actual uh, wire which is powering the Raspberry Pi. And that essentially puts a strong like limitation on where you can actually, uh, the different locations in which your um, cameras can go. So in order to maximize your performance, it would be better to have it battery powered and also to have it waterproof so that you can put it outdoors as well. Uh, also, Motion iOS inherently just doesn't have any sound support. So sound would be a pretty like long shot goal, but it would be nice to at least include that in recordings, which is definitely doable. And I know I said this wasn't useful, but just for the sake of uh, also um, putting these on par with Ring and Nest offerings, including Alexa and Google Home support and things like that is another feature that can make this a bit better. So just uh, to conclude, uh, just talking about what I learned from this, I learned how to use Docker. So I think I mentioned earlier that the way that my uh, NAS is able to connect to each of the three uh, cameras, uh, each of the three Raspberry Pis and combine and, and show you the live feed of all three is by using Docker. So basically I learned how to use that. It's a very useful application, so it'll help with a lot of things. Uh, and I also got a lot of experience with Linux because Basically, everything with Raspberry Pis is done through Linux, and getting experience with uh, Linux is very valuable, and I was able to achieve a lot of that with this project. Uh, also, I learned how to troubleshoot patiently because basically, I had a lot of random bugs and errors in this project on my way to achieving a good final product. And one of those errors, uh, I it was basically I had to write a, a tiny bit of code and I accidentally capitalized the letter instead of non, not capitalizing the letter. And that one thing wasted 72 hours of troubleshooting. And so things like that, um, I learned how to not get like kind of angry over them and just work through them patiently. Also, my mentor taught me how to use a decision matrix, which is a very good objective way of making decisions about your project, because there are many times where I had to choose between different paths and uh, in order to do that as objectively as possible and not just make a potentially bad decision on a whim, uh, learning how to use a decision matrix is a very valuable skill that does that pretty quantitatively. Uh, and also I want to thank my mentor, Adrian Yi, uh, because he helped me with learning a lot of the skills that were necessary for this project, including the decision matrix, and also generally helped me organize a lot of my thinking and make it very methodical. But yeah, thank you. Great job, Pranav. Um, yeah, if there's any questions for Pranav, I think you can uh, put them in the chat now. I did have one question. Uh, I hadn't heard of a decision matrix until you mentioned one, and I guess you found it really useful, one of the more useful things that you learned. Mm -hmm. What's an example of like a kind of decision matrix that you faced? Uh, oh, yeah, so basically, uh, early on in my project, I was trying to decide uh, what, what my what it would act, my surveillance system would actually look like. So I think I mentioned that I basically had three Raspberry Pis that were wirelessly connected to that NAS and each Raspberry Pi was wired to a camera. In, instead of that, I was initially considering just having wireless cameras and ditching those Raspberry Pis altogether. Um, but in order to decide which one I wanted to do, I made a decision matrix that basically rated several different criteria of each option. So like I would just rate them uh, in terms of like, you know, future expandability, uh, technical uncertainty and things like that. Uh, and then I weighted each category and then my mentor helped me do some of the calculations. And then based on that, I was able to turn out one number for each like option. And then that's like a pretty objective way of, I mean, of course there's some uh, bias uh, regardless of what you do, right? Like to decide the actual ratings, uh, but uh, it's a lot better than just arbitrarily saying, oh, I want to do this or I want to do that. So that's 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 basically what a decision matrix is. 
Yeah, that's, that's the new concept to me, but I like the idea of trying to put a numerical number to something that's like, like how much do you care about, how, you, how much do you care about each factor is how you weight it, and then how well each option performs at that is the, the value of that you're weighting by, uh, is that you're multiplying the weight by. So I like that idea a lot. Are there any other questions for Pranav? We'll wait just a little bit in case people are typing. Hi, I had a question and I take a long time to type, so I thought I'd just jump on. Um, but I was wondering kind of what was your process like of deciding, you know, what features were the most important to include and how feasible they were? Um, and how did you kind of go about that? And what were your main goals? I think, you know, you mentioned making it cheaper than other available options, but what else were you like trying to prioritize in this project? Oh, yeah. So basically, uh, when I decided to make a surveillance system, I tried to think about what the most important things that a surveillance system does are. And so for I, in my opinion, that would be being able to easily access the like live footage and then having a lot of space to, to store footage from previous uh, days and things like that. And also uh, being able to, basically the point is to have eyes on the back of your head, right? So that means being able to see in places that you can't already see. So it should be able to, it shouldn't, not everything should be manual, right? Like I think I mentioned that I have automatic motion detection and it automatically records when it senses motion. It, that's very useful, I think, because um, uh, you don't, you, you don't always have to be staring at the live footage and click record, right? As soon as something happens, it'll automatically start recording, which is pretty uh, good. And also um, you get to see in the night. So this functionality carries on in another time where you can't really see, which is in the night. You may be sleeping or something, but it's still going. So those four things are the most important, in my opinion, when you just think about what a surveillance system even does. And then when you bring in the fact that I'm trying to kind of outperform these uh, other options, then uh, that makes it more complicated because you also have to take into account uh, how expensive it is because it has to be cheaper. And then also um, you have to make sure that it's not like, for example, like there are just some things that are a little bit less fancy, less technical. Like for example, it can be super huge and bulky because the ring and nest ones may be really tiny and then they might fit in many different places. But if mine is super huge, then it won't work, right? So you have to consider things like that as well. Yeah, great. Sounds like a really uh, difficult process and sounds like you did a great job with it. Good job. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for now. So our next and last presenter is Lauren. Uh, I will add you, Lauren. Oh, hi. hi. Yeah, so same thing for you, Lauren. I will leave my video as soon as you get your slides up. And then, yeah, at six minutes in, I'll return without my video on as your two-minute warning. And then I'll turn it back on when it's time to wrap up. Sounds great. Thank yep. you. That's okay. good. Cool. Um, as previously mentioned, hi, my name is Lauren, and I will be presenting on creating a research proposal on metabolism, apoptosis, and the tumor microenvironment. So before I begin, I'd like to kind of go over a brief presentation roadmap. I'm first going to be exploring why is cancer so hard to kill? Next, I'm going to go into my key question. And third, I'm going to look at my research proposal and walk you through how I kind of address my key question. Cool. Okay. So first, a quick explanation on why cancer. My mom is a dermatologist, and I think she's always threatened me with getting skin cancer, specifically in relation to me wearing sunscreen. And that's kind of how I first got exposed. But I think from there, my curiosity kind of became, why does cancer kind of do what it does? Why do bodies and cells in your body turn against you? And kind of how does it all work? So for those reasons, I approached my Polygents project with the question, why is cancer so tough to kill? So kind of through my some preliminary research, I kind of set, zoned in on three main reasons why cancer is so tough to kill. First is that it evades cell death. Second is that it has a tumor microenvironment to support it. And third, it has altered metabolism that allows it to proliferate. So I'm next going to go into a few, an explanation of what each of the, these is. Evading cell death, there are kind of three different main types of cell death that tumors undergo. First is necrosis, second is autophagy, and third is apoptosis. For the purpose of my research, I 
focused on apoptosis because it's key to cancer treatment such as chemotherapy because it's the predetermined cell death and it's most affected by external factors again such as chemotherapy. Next on the tumor microenvironment. The tumor microenvironment basically recruits has it's just a collection of cells that the tumor has recruited and reprogrammed to feed it one metabolites and proliferate and allow it to proliferate two, protect the tumor cells from detection, and three, provide the ideal conditions for the tumor to grow. So in my research proposal, I specifically focused on cancer-associated fibroblasts, which I will reference for the rest of this presentation as CAFs. So CAFs are part of the tumor microenvironment, and specifically how they relate to apoptosis, because that was kind of my goal in looking at the tumor microenvironment, was that CAF suppress apoptosis in host tumor cells by secreting cytokines and metabolites and blocking pro-apoptotic signaling. From here, kind of in my research process, I kind of latched onto the fact that CAFs are able to affect um, tumor cells through metabolites, and I started to examine altered uh, tumor metabolism. And I learned that a lot of tumors are able to avoid apoptosis because they alter their metabolism. And they basically do this, again, to avoid apoptosis and also keep up with their high energy needs. And kind of through research and kind of looking at all the literature available, I realized that the changes in metabolism within the tumor cell are very well characterized, but not what causes those changes. So that's what led to me to the key question that my research proposal aims to examine, which are how do changes in calf metabolism affect host tumor susceptibility to apoptosis? And this leads me to my research proposal. As a quick disclaimer here, my research proposal um, kind of suggests a plethora of experiments that are not necessarily feasible for me to do, and they're kind of too expensive, but they're, it's kind of a thought experiment in if I were had limitless resources, what, how could I examine this problem? So before I get into specifically what my um, what my pro or research proposal talks about, I want to go through a key a few of the key models and techniques that I used. First is pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. I'm going to refer to this as PDAC for the rest of the presentation. It's the fourth most deadly cancer in the United States, and it has a very poor prognosis rate. And I basically use this as my model tumor to, to exam in my research proposal. And I specifically chose this because of its like poor prognosis rate and because PDAC resistance is largely attributed to CAFs. So understanding the, react the interaction between the two is very important. Next, BH3 profiling is a method I use to detect, uh, that I propose to use to detect apoptosis priming or apoptosis susceptibility in tumor cells. And third, KPC mice, they're basically mice that are genetically bred to be born with a normal pancreas and develop PDAC over their lifetimes. Um, so I would harvest the PDAC cells from these mice and kind of use them in certain um, experiments. And kind of whether or not I use cell lines or these mice depends on the context. So my hypothesis for the general, this entire presentation, this entire research proposal was that enhanced glycolytic metabolism and fatty acid excretion in calf populations promotes tumor apoptosis. And kind of the, the way that I chunked out my research proposal was I had a main section on glucose metabolism um, and a second section with fatty acid metabolism. So that's kind of how I'm going to examine to talk about it right now. So first, glucose metabolism I is I had three different um, kind of hypotheses. One, that calves harvested from a mouse model of PDAC will show a KPC mice will show a preference for glycolytic metabolism. Two, that glycolytic calves will increase apoptotic priming in PDAC cells. And three, that extracellular lactate excreted by tumor cells causes apoptosis priming. So the experiment's kind of in the same order that I used to address these um, these hypotheses are one profiling gene and protein expression of the metabolism of calves. So what would they normally look like in a KPC mouse as a proxy for humans? And I just sort of differentiated between glycolytic, which is lactate and LDH versus um, oxidative, which is kind of pyruvate to acetyl CoA, and that's managed by PDH. I um, mean, I sort of um, profile, I proposed to profile the expression of LDH, PDH, and a bunch of different metabolites. Second, I want to test the effect of calf glucose metabolism on apoptosis priming of PDAC cells in vitro. So that basically involves upregulating and knocking out LDH and PDH in calves, um, calf cell lines, co-culturing them with PDAC cell lines, and then using BH3 profiling to examine apoptosis priming.
And then to specifically test the hypothesis that lactate uptake um, is what affects PDAC apoptosis priming, I'm going to co-culture PDAC with lactate and use BH3 profiling. Next, for my lipid metabolism um, section of my proposal, I, I suggest that calf secrete lipids, which are taken up by PDAC cells via CD36, which decreases apoptosis priming by inhibiting pro-apoptotic factors. And the experiments that I use to do this are one, profile calf lipid metabolism as I would have with the glucose metabolism. Second, manipulate calf excretion of fatty acids to PDAC cells and examining the effect on apoptosis priming. I would do this specifically through fatty acid synthase and assay the metabolic exchange between calves and PDAC. And I would use this using, do this using 13 ta carbon tagged glucose. So the impacts of this proposal, it's are just that it's really important to understand how PDAC interacts with its microenvironment and surroundings in order to understand how we can best treat it. And that's kind of what my proposal is getting at. So my next steps would be to one, perform a simpler, um, I'm kind of working on this right now, is to perform a simpler, a few of the simpler experiments and adapted ones at my school lab. Um, and second is to use the research as a springboard to start working at like a university lab or something like that. So special thanks to my mentor, Amy, who supported me throughout my entire project and was really amazing. And thank you so much for watching. Cool. Great job, Lauren. It felt like I was watching a research proposal from someone in my, my PhD program or something. Okay. Uh, we have an immunology focus in my program too. So a lot of this felt very familiar to me. Um, are there any questions? Um, feel free to put them in the, in the session chat. In the meantime, I had a question um, this was a, a particular form of cancer. I, I know that at the beginning you mentioned that your mom got you very scared of skin cancer. Is there a reason you focused on this particular kind for your for your proposal? Is it like is there something about it that makes it a, a good model for asking these questions about cancer? Um, yeah. Yeah, um, it was mostly because PDAC kind of resistance to apoptosis and things like that are specifically regulated by cancer associated fibroblasts. So a lot of the literature I was reading um, and kind of the references that I used to craft my proposal were talking about kind of how PDAC um, interacts a little bit, but not specifically with the issue that I examined my research proposal. Thank you. There's a, another comment in the chat that says, wow, what a great presentation. I hope your research projects go well and you're able to work on this further in your university lab. Thank you. <laughs> I agree. Alrighty, yeah. So I think technically we're we're at the end of this session. I'm glad you, uh, glad you all could make it uh, and join in and watch all these really exciting talks on, and they were all very different, very different kinds of projects as well, from research proposals to literature reviews to a hands-on project as well. So uh, I'm really excited that I got to, to meet all of you and see all your projects and want to say congratulations, great job to all the presenters. Thank you so much. All right. Bye everyone, thanks for coming. <laughs>